Hi, Chris Potts here. This video discusses the famous principle of compositionality. My goal is to explain what the principle says and what it means for us as semanticists, and I also want to explore some challenges to the principle and what we should make of them. This will set us up nicely for our next two units, a unit on adjective meanings and a unit on noun compound meanings. The principle of compositionality is absolutely central to the kind of semantic theory that we're going to develop to such a degree that people sometimes even refer to this as compositional semantics. And you even see its central place when you look at the title of our foundational reading by Barbara Partee, Lexical Semantics and Compositionality. And I'd like to add that Barbara Partee is a central figure in this entire field. She was one of the first linguists to see the importance of compositionality and identify its core empirical consequences in the early 1970s. So the theories we develop are as much shaped by her vision and her contributions as they are by the principle of compositionality itself. In this context, I can't resist a brief aside. Barbara and I were colleagues together in the UMass Amherst Linguistics Department for six years, where I got my start as a professor. Uh, and Barbara became a dear friend to me and my wife. Well, well, not my wife at the time. The point is that Barbara is the person who married my wife and me. In Massachusetts, you can pay the state a fee in order to imbue a particular person with the power to, quote, solemnize a single occasion. We chose Barbara for that, and she took the role very seriously, and she was clearly enchanted by the extremely rarefied speech act power that this gave her. Anyway, I digress. Back to compositionality. Uh, in section one, I've given the statement of the principle that Parti offers in our core reading. It says, the meaning of a whole is a function of the meanings of the parts and of the way they are syntactically combined. Now, as you can imagine, there are more technical and mathematical statements of the principle out there, but I think this informal statement conveys the intuitive scope and power of the principle. The first thing I want to emphasize about compositionality is that it poses a serious technical analytic challenge for us stemming from the fact that we need to give an independent meaning to every word and explain how meanings combine systematically to create meanings for all the phrasal nodes. To get a feel for this, let's consider the sentence, every smart linguist knows that the principle of compositionality places a lot of pressure on us. What I've depicted here is a very simple constituent structure for the sentence of the sort one might posit in a syntax class. You can read the words off of the leaf nodes at the bottom, and the groupings reflect the internal constituent structure of the sentence. Now, you can think of compositionality as defining a recursive process of interpreting trees like this. For example, at the very bottom, you have the lexical items, which are atomic elements. The compositionality principle requires us to explain how these atomic elements combine with each other to form phrases. So, for example, smart and linguist are lexical items and compositionality demands that we explain how they combine to form a meaning for the phrase smart linguist here. And then we also need to explain how that phrasal meaning combines with every to form a meaning for every smart linguist, and so forth for all of these other meanings. We'll work our way up from the bottom, recursively de deriving meanings from the constituent parts until we get a meaning for this big verb phrase, knows that the principle of compositionality places a lot of pressure on us, and that meaning, whatever it is, needs to combine with what we derive for every smart linguist to give us the meaning of the entire sentence. So now the challenges should be evident. If this is the structure, we need to figure out how to give independent meanings to highly abstract elements like every, that, and presumably even the pieces of a lot of here. And we need to assign meaning in a way that will let us make good predictions about the phrases that these words participate in. So, for example, whatever we do with the words a, uh, la, and of, we need them to combine together to give us a sensible meaning for a lot of in this context. All right, why are we doing this to ourselves? What are the motivations for adopting the compositionality principle? I've listed out some common motivations here. The, the first is just that, as semanticists, we should probably feel pressure to model all of the meaningful units of language. Words and phrases intuitively have meanings, and we're in the business of saying what those meanings are, presumably. There are also some cognitive and behavioral motivations. This is often commonly described in terms of our, quote, infinite capacity to produce and interpret novel utterances. Of course, Sadly, we're all finite beings, and so we don't have an infinite capacity for anything. But this could be phrased more modestly in terms of linguistic creativity. We all very routinely produce and interpret novel utterances successfully, and compositionality supports an explanation for why we're able to do that. 
we learn the lexical items as atomic elements of our language, and we acquire some perhaps very general methods for combining meanings to produce new meanings, and that's all we need. That is, from a finite, indeed very small, set of primitives, we acquire a capacity to build and interpret entirely novel linguistic objects. The final motivation is what's called systematicity. This is a general topic in cognitive science, and it has special relevance for language. The idea here is that if you know what linguist means, and you know what philosopher means, and you know that linguist and philosopher are distrib distributionally related, then you know what every smart philosopher means. And similarly, if you know what silly means, and you know it's distributionally like smart, then you know what silly linguist means, and also what silly philosopher means, and so forth and so on. Your knowledge of language is systematic in this very intricate and particular sense. And of course, compositionality can be seen as an explanation for why your knowledge of language has this striking property. Now, I like all these motivations, but I do want to be careful here. None of these motivations implies compositionality in any logical or conceptual sense. Indeed, compositionality is arguably a very particular and very restrictive way of explaining these observations. As you can probably tell by now, compositionality is in some sense a methodology, a way of thinking about how to conduct investigations of linguistic meaning. And Partee expands on this in this nice quotation here. Compositional semantics is typically a matter of working backwards from intuitions about sentences' truth conditions and reasoning our way among alternative hypotheses concerning lexical meanings, syntactic structure, and modes of semantic composition. Choices of any one of those constrain choices among the others. Some choices lead to dead ends or at least make things much harder. Others survive. Now, you can get a feel for this by looking back at my example. If the syntacticians conclude that of pressure here is a prepositional phrase in a lot of pressure, then the syntactic tree will look different and then I'll have to revise my assumptions about the atomic lexical meanings and how they combine, and this might have widespread consequences for my theory. But on the bright side of this, compositionality is pushing us to give explanations where the lexicon, syntax, and meanings all interact with each other. That feels right for natural languages, and it can be very exciting. So that's the basic picture. To get a deeper feel for the compositionality principle, it's informative to think about various challenges that might arise for it. I mentioned that Partee has been one of the biggest champions of the compositionality principle. She's also been one of its most incisive critics. Her classic 1984 article, Compositionality, is a perfect illustration. It's about one-third's discussion of what the principle is and two-thirds discussion of the challenges to the principle. And here I'm going to highlight just a few of them. The first is sort of a historical curiosity. It's very common to see compositionality attributed to the early modern philosopher Gottlob Frege, and it's sometimes even called Frege's principle. However, as Janssen and many others have noted, this is odd because Frege actually only explicitly endorsed a principle of contextuality, which says one should ask for the meaning of a word only in the context of a sentence and not in isolation. And that sounds like a challenge to compositionality. After all, I just got through explaining how compositionality requires us to give meanings to words in isolation. Now, I think the theory will develop as actually in harmony with this Frege and the perhaps mythical Frege of the compositionality principle, but it's still worth meditating on the apparent tension here. In terms of direct challenges, I think ambiguity resolution is a clear one that's worth reflecting on. For ambiguous words, the meaning we're most likely to assume is shaped by the surrounding context. So, for example, the word crane is ambiguous between a bird and a piece of machinery. If I say the crane flew away, then you're likely to assume that I mean the bird. And if I say the crane picked up a large steel beam, then you're likely to assume that I mean the machine. And if I say three, you might be left wondering what I mean. That sentence is, I saw a crane on my way to class. In all these cases, though, you use or try to use linguistic and world knowledge to make a guess about what I mean by the word crane. And this is a highly non-local thing. You're using all the words in the sentence, among other things, to figure out what a single word means. And that seems like a challenge to compositionality. Now, the usual response is that semantics is about representations, whereas ambiguity resolution is about how people use those representations. I think that makes sense and it seems fine and all that, but I would again want to emphasize that this is a very particular way 
of viewing the world and language. And it's possible to imagine alternatives that don't make this representation versus use distinction. The second challenge is perhaps easier to sort out. Parkti calls this the challenge of things being in the wrong place. For example, a prominent reading of sentence four, an occasional sailor strolled by, is one we might paraphrase as occasionally a sailor strolled by. Here it seems like the attributive adjective has leapt out of its noun phrase to become a sentential adverb. In five, we have a classic case of what's called scope inversion. The maxim, all that glitters is not gold, has two readings. The surface reading would seem to say something like, if X glitters, X is not gold. Now, that's straightforwardly false, since gold often glitters. The intended meaning is one where the negation and the quantifier all have switched places. It's more like, not all that glitters is gold. By the way, here's a funny instance where these two readings seem to be in play together in a way that's admittedly quite confusing. For cases like this, the usual response is that the logical form may be different from the surface form, and compositionality is defined on logical forms. This makes good sense to me, and I think any theory will have to grapple with these clear mismatches between form and meaning. And on balance, it seems to me that thinking in compositional terms has helped us make progress on understanding these interesting phenomena of things being in the wrong place. The final challenge I want to mention is noun compounds. Partee discusses noun compounds, and she directly states that they have meanings that are not derived compositionally. She says, in compounds, there is no general rule for predicting the interpretation of the combination. A toy store, in typical context, is a store that sells toys. A toy box is a box that holds toys, and so on. Semanticists in general do not expect a semantic theory to provide a compositional semantics for compounds, but do expect a compositional semantics for modifier head constructions. The reasoning is that native speakers cannot generally interpret a novel compound on first hearing on the basis of knowledge of the language alone, but can do so for a novel modifier noun construction. We're going to critically examine these claims using the paper by Levine, Glass, and Jurafsky titled Systematicity in the Semantics of Noun Compounds, the Role of Artifacts versus Natural Kinds. This paper finds that while noun compounds may not be compositional in the strict sense of the principle, their meanings are predictable in many ways, suggesting systematicity of the sort I described above, without, though, all the restrictive consequences of compositionality itself. The paper is really innovative in terms of its empirical methods, and I think it offers deep insights about the compositionality principle itself. So stay tuned for that later in the quarter.